as I indicated before, one of the important uh, stakeholders as we discuss CDR governance are non-governmental organizations. And uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, has been an important uh, uh, NGO participant in a lot of the discussion of what uh, the architecture of, of governance of CDR approaches should look like, including in the context of coastal and ocean approaches. And so I'm pleased today to have our, uh, our final presentation today be by representatives from NRDC and, uh, and someone who has uh, worked with NRDC on these issues. So uh, the two presenters today will be uh, Rebecca Loomis, who serves as a legal fellow in the Oceans Division of the Nature Program at NRDC, and uh, Simon Engler, who is a JD candidate at uh, Yale Law School and has worked with uh, NRDC on these issues. And so I will uh, turn it over to uh, Rebecca to uh, structure the presentation. Thank you very much, Becca. Great, thank you, Will. Let me share our slides here. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Becca Loomis. Um, as Will said, I am a legal fellow at NRDC and Yale Law School. And today, Simon and I will be presenting on our ongoing work on research governance for ocean-based CDR. So I'm going to turn it over to Simon to get us started. Thanks, Becca. Carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, refers to the deliberate removal and long-term storage of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Ocean CDR activities comprise CDR that takes place in the ocean and coasts or by enhancing or accelerating ocean processes. Ocean-based CDR technologies include nutrient fertilization, artificial upwelling and downwelling, macroalgae cultivation, ocean alkalinity enhancement, and electrochemical ocean CDR. All of these technologies are in the research and development stage, and none has yet shown capability to remove and durably store carbon, carbon at the gigaton scale. Interest in ocean-based CDR is growing among scientists, policymakers, and the tech community. And startups are already contemplating and planning field studies in the ocean and on the coast. Establishing a framework for governing this ocean-based CDR research is critical. First, although some view the ocean as an empty or unused space, there's a high density of uses within several miles from shore, and even the deep ocean is home to rich biodiversity and ecology. CDR research carries a serious potential to harm the marine environment and wildlife, and the human communities who depend upon and use this space. Those risks include, among other things, entanglement from aquaculture and changes in ocean pH that harm marine organisms. Second, many parts of the ocean fall beyond national jurisdiction. In the absence of a central governance structure or of oversight, this space is more vulnerable to risky or high impact research. Relatedly, CDR experiments in the ocean environment, for example, those that alter nutrient levels, or add minerals, have serious potential for transboundary impacts due to the interconnectedness of the world's oceans and the constant motion of ocean currents. Third, all research and technologies that address climate change must consider equity and distributive justice. Responsibility for the climate crisis falls mainly on the developed world, and the burdens and any benefits of addressing climate change must be distributed fairly. This is particularly true for ocean-based CDR, where transboundary impacts are likely. What's more, many coastal frontline communities rely on marine resources for their livelihoods and should be involved in decisions that will impact those resources. Besides the need for protections from the adverse impacts of ocean-based CDR research, a code of conduct is also needed to ensure that researchers prove the efficacy of ocean-based CDR. That is, the ability of the proposed technologies to achieve additional and long-term carbon sequestration that can be measured and verified. In the US, 
there's no central legal or regulatory tool for guiding ocean-based CDR research, and some activities may fall outside of existing regulations. Ocean Visions, which is a nonprofit organization working to accelerate the development and testing of ocean-based CDR, held a series of workshops in 2020 and in 2021, which brought together scientists, policymakers, NGOs, funders, and government officials working on ocean-based CDR. That group concluded that a code of conduct for the research is needed. Ocean-based CDR enterprises are currently developing their own internal codes of conduct, but there's also a need for a code that will govern ocean-based CDR research across the board and not just for and by any one individual company. An industry-wide code would help build trust, encourage common norms about good behavior, and create some social pressure for organizations to follow those norms. Ideally, a code of conduct would serve as a starting point for future regulations that are legally enforceable and are managed by institutions accountable to the public. Our goal was to identify key elements and principles that should be included in an ocean-based CDR code of conduct. In pursuit of this goal, several questions guided and continue to guide our research. First, does ocean-based CDR research need a unique code of conduct, or can we rely or adapt existing codes of conduct for geoengineering to govern ocean-based CDR research? Second, are there common elements in existing research codes of conduct that can inform elements of an ocean-based CDR code? How much variation is there among those elements? To begin answering these research questions, we examined research codes of conduct for emerging technologies and research practices with uncertain implications for human, animal, or environmental welfare in order to identify common elements and principles. Recognizing that each research area has unique practical and ethical demands, our reviews sought to identify common elements that could serve as a starting point for a code of conduct for ocean-based CDR. First, we identified a preliminary list of important elements of a research code of conduct from a qualitative literature review drawing on existing codes of conduct. These elements are listed here in this slide and on the next slide. Quickly, they are defining the purpose of the code, defining the scope of the code's applicability, defining the code's key terms, providing guiding principles that practitioners and researchers can use when interpreting or applying the code, flexibility provisions for updating or adapting the code, requirements that research be justified by potential benefits of that research, tiered research or deployment structures by scale or methodology, requirements having to do with the assessment of adverse impacts before, during, and after experiments, requirements for the minimization of harms before, during, and after experiments, the assignment of responsibility or liability for impacts, requirements that practitioners and researchers publish or disseminate their results, provisions having to do with scientific integrity and public and stakeholder engagement, consideration of fairness, equity, or social issues, both within and beyond the direct impacts of an experiment, and finally, rules about funding. Having identified these elements, we then conducted a systematic search for research-related codes of conduct to identify common elements and principles. We reviewed the codes that resulted from our search to identify the frequency of occurrence for each of the elements in the codes of conduct. To identify codes of conduct, we ran the search string that you can see on the screen here in Google, Google Scholar, ProQuest, and Academic Search Premier, or EBSCO, without time constraints. And we did this for a number, number of research fields, um, everything from geoengineering and CDR to stem cell research, synthetic biology, animal subjects research, biosecurity, and a number of other fields that you can see in this slide. This search yielded 19 codes of conduct um, in a number of disciplines. We also added the Asilomar principles, even though they were not captured by our search because they are one of the most notable sets of geoengineering principles that had been proposed. And this resulted in a total of 20 results. And you can see in this slide the breakdown of the disciplines for those 20 codes. Great. 
Thank you, Simon. So I'm going to start by presenting the results of our review. Um, we divided our list of elements conceptually into two categories. First, elements that facilitate implementation and application of the code of conduct. And second, so, oh, second, core values and principles for responsible research. This table on the slide shows the occurrence of code elements uh, for implementation and application in each code of conduct that we reviewed. The code elements you can see across the top, including defining the purpose and scope of the code. Um, and then each row represents a different code of conduct that we reviewed, which we've grouped into the field of research. Um, as you can see, they include geoengineering, stem cell research, et cetera. Uh, in X indicates that the element is, we found the element in the code. And you can see from the two leftmost columns of X's that most codes included a definition of purpose and also a definition of scope. Uh, while most codes defined their scope and purpose, fewer than half of the codes that we reviewed provided guiding or interpretive principles definitions of key terms, or mechanisms for updating or adapting the code. This table shows the occurrence of principles of responsible research in each code of conduct. So again, these principles are listed across the top, and Simon went over them before. They include uh, provisions uh, requiring assessment of adverse impacts, minimization of harms, and so on. Um, and the rows, again, are grouped by research fields, and each represents um, one of the same codes of conduct from the previous table. Half or more of the codes that we surveyed contained the following core principles, uh, minimization of harms, assessment of adverse impacts, justifying research by potential benefit, public and stakeholder engagement, scientific integrity provisions, provisions for publication or dissemination of results, and consideration of fairness, equity, or other social issues. The other three principles, rules about funding, assignment of responsibility or liability for impacts, and a tiered research, uh, a tiered research structure by scale or methodology, we found in fewer than half of the codes. And this table shows um, the frequency of occurrence of each principle um, as a percentage of the number of codes that we reviewed. Our overarching goal is to identify the key elements and principles that should be included in an ocean-based CDR research code of conduct. And as Simon said, we posed a few questions. First, whether ocean-based CDR research needs a unique code of conduct. Second, whether we could identify common elements in existing research codes of conduct. And relatedly, how much variation exists among these common elements. Of the core principles for CDR research that we identified, seven appeared in half or more of the codes surveyed. And these codes treated research methodologies across disparate fields. As a result, we believe that these principles should be seriously considered for inclusion in any code of conduct for ocean-based CDR research. And you can see them again listed on the slide here. Additionally, Two crucial elements for code implementation and application appeared in most of the codes we reviewed, and these were defining the purpose of the code and defining the scope of the code. Again, these are key elements for an ocean-based CDR research code of conduct. We found each of the elements and principles identified in at least a few of the codes that we reviewed, but there was significant variation um, among codes. This is the same table I showed earlier. Uh, and again, it shows the occurrence of research principles in each of the different codes. And uh, this table sort of highlights the variation. You can see how um, the various codes were distributed differently. I'm sorry, how the various elements and principles were distributed differently across the codes that we reviewed. No element or principle appeared in more than 80% of the codes that we surveyed. And this leads us to believe that developing a code of conduct specific to ocean-based CDR would best promote responsible research in this field. Um, we think that the lack of commonality across codes 
may be a result of first, the specific needs of various research fields. So for example, in animal subjects research, assignment of responsibility or liability for impacts is really not largely relevant because you don't see impacts outside of the lab. By contrast, for field experiments um, that test geoengineering technologies, there's a higher potential for widespread transboundary adverse impacts. And therefore, there's the need to think about assigning liability for these adverse impacts in advance, and also to potentially think about um, who's liable for infrastructure decommissioning in advance. Um, additionally, some research fields may already be subject to laws and regulations. And this would make it unnecessary to duplicate certain principles and codes of conduct. So this may be another reason that there is significant variation across uh, different fields of research. Uh, as Simon noted, we examined five codes of conduct that specifically address geoengineering. And here geoengineering uh, includes solar radiation management and CDR. Within these five codes, the most frequently occurring principles were assessment of adverse impacts, justifying research by potential benefit, publishing and disseminating results, public and stakeholder engagement, and consideration of fairness and equity. And each of these principles was found in 80 to 100% of the five codes. These principles share a common theme. All of them concern and include a broader community than just scientists or researchers. And the prevalence of these inclusive principles probably reflects the understanding of the drafters of these codes that geoengineering research really has the potential uh, for these widespread and global impacts and impacts to commonly held resources um, in our oceans, you know, both our oceans themselves and also the um, resources found in the oceans. As a result, researchers and practitioners in geoengineering really have an ethical obligation to involve the public and to involve the communities who will be impacted by research on these technologies and who will also be eventually impacted by the possible deployment of these technologies. We'd also like to highlight the 2017 Code of Conduct for Responsible Geoengineering Research by Anna Maria Hubert as a potential model for, ocean -based, for an ocean-based CDR research code of conduct. This code includes 13 of the 15 elements and principles that we identified, and it could be adapted or supplemented to specifically address ocean-based CDR research. Overall, our results highlight core principles of research responsibility that should be included in any ocean-based CDR code of conduct. Research codes from other fields may serve as a useful model or starting off point, but ultimately the variation across fields and the unique aspects of ocean-based CDR research warrant a specific code of conduct for this area. Our work is still in progress and uh, future avenues for research include considering the unique, considering in more depth the unique aspects of ocean-based CDR uh, that a code of conduct should address or anticipate. And these unique aspects include jurisdictional issues, like addressing transboundary impacts and addressing areas that do, uh, do not have state oversight. Uh, and these issues also include um, environmental impacts, including the impact of CDR on the ocean carbon cycle. So thank you for your attention, and we welcome your questions and comments. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Becca and Simon. And uh, I will uh, I will initially look for uh, uh, for questions. And um, while those are being uh, uh, populated, I think I'll ask you uh, an, an initial question of my own. Um, it, it, this is probably beyond what uh, uh, what you were looking at in uh, in this work, but uh, did you did you come across any discussions of the impacts that these codes of conduct have had uh, in these in these different sectors that uh, that they've been promulgated in? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, and we didn't, we haven't focused on that yet. I think that's a really important area. 
to look into um, both the impact of having a code of conduct, a voluntary code of conduct, and I think also um, the um, degree of maybe compliance with codes of conduct. Some codes included, uh, especially institutional ones, would sometimes include in enforcement mechanisms might be a little strong, but enforcement mechanisms of a sort or a review board that would kind of assess compliance with codes or um, address code violations. And so that's that's another important area um, that we have that's part of any code of conduct would be sort of a governance body, but we haven't focused on that specifically. Okay. Uh, question from uh, from uh, Romani. Assuming a, a code of conduct is adopted, how do you promote acceptance of it or compliance of it? How do researchers and developer, how do you get researchers and uh, developers to buy in? That seems to have been a problem with uh, past codes of, of conduct. Yeah, thanks, Romani. Um, I, I agree. That's definitely a significant concern. I think part um part of the argument for promoting acceptance compliance and buy-in um is that there there really is there are widespread public concerns i think about a lot of these technologies and um there is some degree of resistance um among different aspects of the environmental community to um to technology implementing technologies at a, at a large scale that would affect the, the global climate system. And even though we're really talking about research here and sort of the earlier stages of this process, um, I think there's a tendency to hear about geoengineering, even early geoengineering research, and, and that can be kind of a scary notion for um, the public and for stakeholders. And so I think um, signing on to a voluntary code of conduct is a way to build trust. It's a way to increase buy-in uh, for these technologies. And I think this really does apply even in the research stage. Um, another way to promote acceptance and compliance is to uh, develop a code of conduct um, ultimately in a way that involves all sectors um, or all, all members of the different communities who are um, thinking about geoengineering and CDR and thinking about these issues. So this would include researchers, practitioners, um, uh, the you know the business and startup community, um, universities and lawyers, policymakers. So I think ha um, having a sort of broad process is really important here. Yeah, and I would also just add that there are some codes of conduct in other research fields that ask funders of research to think about the compliance um, of research with potential codes. And that seems to me to be another potential avenue for, if not promoting acceptance, at least encouraging compliance. I, I'm curious uh, if, if you've seen in your research, where is the genesis most of the time of these codes of conduct? Because as we think about who might develop such codes in the CDR community, um, that's something that might be germane. Uh, did, did you see where, who, who developed these in other in other sectors in the past? Was it uh, was it uh, uh, a, uh, a an individual company, for example, that might have initially driven the process, or an association, or did it come from academia? They come from a few different sources. Uh, they come from academia. Um, they come from universities, and they come from organizations that conduct research. Uh, some of them are specific to um, a, a country, and so uh, the um, a coalition of people doing nanotechnology research in that country um, develop a code of conduct. Um, some are from uh, large-scale panels, things like NAS, um, international, similar international panels. Uh, that's often the genesis of these. Um, I would say, Simon, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's all sounds right to me. 
Okay, thank you. Um, another question from uh, uh, from uh, is is there a list of the codes of conduct that you reviewed that's uh, available somewhere? Um, I have that, and I could share it with people who are interested. Um, it's not uh, online or anything. Happy to share that. Okay, that'd be great. Um, question from uh, John Fitzgerald: How would your proposed code? be integrated with the White House Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy. Uh, uh, these scientific integrity principles uh, are now being revised by the OSTP uh, by the, in the White House. I'm not familiar with those principles or the revisions that are being done to them, but I know I, for one, would be curious to hear from John or from anyone else about about those revisions and hear a little more about the question that you're asking. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let's see, um, a different take on uh, Romney's question from uh, Brad Warren. Uh, can, you share ex uh, uh, can you share examples of where um, a, a research code of conduct was enforced with far reaching results. Can we learn from these instances how to make it work? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so, you know, as I said, we haven't focused yet on in sort of enforcement or um, the ultimate results of implementation, but that's definitely an avenue for further research. Simon, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, yeah, I would add that as far as I know, there aren't any empirical studies of the effectiveness of specifically research-focused codes of conduct. I have seen some studies of codes of conduct that aren't related to science, um, but I think sort of intuitively one place where we can say there has been success, um, far-reaching success of research codes of conduct have to do with animal experimentation. Um, and I think that one thing we can take from, from that experience has to do with sort of the internalization of the norms that a code of conduct is espousing by researchers. Um, I think that many people who do research or experimentation on animals would be able to briefly describe what the main ethical principles are relating to that sort of process without ever consulting the sort of document that actually formally binds them to those commitments. And I think it speaks to the potential for like, norm uptake in an informal sense to help generate compliance by researchers and practitioners, um, not just in that field or any other field, but also in, in ocean-based CDR. Uh, I'd also like to address um, uh, David's comment in the chat um, and, and sort of highlight and flag that um, there is a group uh, working uh, with or working uh, through the Aspen Institute and Climate Works right now to uh, develop uh, a framework for an ocean-based CDR research code of conduct, um, and uh, which I'm also a part of, and we plan to release uh, this framework around the time um, I believe in October or November when the NAS panel will be releasing their. Um, uh, research roadmap for ocean-based CDR research. Okay. Um, at that time, I think, I, I, I had one, one question. I was curious about one criteria that you had established, and maybe I misunderstood it, but uh, it, it sounded like you made the argument that uh, we should require researchers not only to assess the potential impact of discrete experiments, but also the broader implications if said technology was deployed uh, on a wide scale. Is that correct? I know. I, so I believe the idea in a, in a code of conduct that's specific to research, it would be impacts and assignment of responsibility, which are two separate things, but assessing impacts and assigning responsibility for impacts from that research. Um, the principle that mentioned deployment was um, uh, having a tiered um, research model for, uh, uh, I'm sorry, having a tiered structure for research um, and or deployment. And by that we wanted to include deployment because 
um, progressing or demonstrating proof of concept in field studies. And then, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, lab studies and modeling, and then in field studies before deployment is an important component of that. But um, ass assessing adverse impacts for deployment, I think, is an important part of research. But the assessment of adverse impacts was really targeted towards those of doing field experiments on geoengineering technologies. All right, great. Thank you for that. Okay, we have uh, we have uh, reached the end of our time for uh, the presentation and uh, for uh, the first day of the conference. I'd like to again thank uh, Becca and Simon for your excellent presentation as well as the uh, questions. Um, I, I I look forward to seeing uh, what uh, what develops out of this. Uh, it, it it should be interesting uh, and uh, and. Uh, We'll, we'll look forward to seeing that later. Okay, uh, thank you everyone uh, for an excellent first day. I hope that uh, all of you can join us uh, tomorrow morning uh, when we will reconvene at, uh, uh, let me make sure I'm saying the uh, correct time uh, for tomorrow, uh, at uh, uh, 9 a.m. tomorrow at Eastern time. And we uh, started today focusing on the potential role of uh, domestic uh, uh, institutions in regulating CDR. Tomorrow we'll kick off with a focus on international regulation of, of CDR options. And, and uh, that will be followed by a, a focus on uh, case studies in, uh, in ocean CDR project development, uh, as well as finally, uh, a look at setting standards for uh, carbon storage and lessons uh, that we can learn from carbon capture and sequestration in the nearshore uh, seabed. So uh, I hope to see everybody uh, tomorrow. Uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Goodbye until tomorrow.